A series of horrific unsolved crimes that brought 20 years of terror to Italy. There was great terror, great fear. Over two decades, seven helpless couples are stalked by a deranged and perverted killer. There was a maniac gone the loose in Florence who murdered them and mutilated the genitalia of the young women. I woke up many times at night with the image of mutilated bodies in front of my eyes. Investigators struggle to snare a killer who evades the police at will. There was a widespread sense of hopelessness. This is the story of murders so savage they could only be committed by a monster. Florence, one of the most romantic cities in the world. But in the 1980s, Italy is a deeply religious country where premarital sex is frowned upon. <laughs> a young couple escaped to the countryside, far from the watchful eye of parents. <laughs> The isolation this couple seek will turn out to be anything but romantic. On the morning of June the 6th, 1981, an off-duty policeman makes a gruesome discovery. The bodies of two young lovers. Forensic pathologist Giovanni Morello examines the victims. The couple had numerous injuries on their bodies. A number of gunshot wounds and a number of knife wounds. Journalist Mario Spezzi is one of the first people on the crime scene. I saw the guy in the car. He seemed like he was sleeping because he had his head resting on the side window. And the only things that showed that something had happened was the pale face, the broken glass and a small black mark on his head. Former Chief Inspector Ruggero Perugini knows that even the smallest clue could lead them to their killer. Every element of the crime scene is essential. What is missing, what is there, the context, the details are essential. Investigators piece together the victim's final evening. 21-year-old Carmela Di Nuccio and her 30-year-old boyfriend Giovanni Foggi had spent the evening at the local disco before driving up into the hills for a lover's tryst. Not only have the couple been brutally executed, the killer has violated the female victim in a sinister and sickening way. We were perplexed by the fury of the attack, especially the violence inflicted on the girl. She had her pubic area cut out. She had, very shockingly, a wound below her abdomen that could not really be described as a wound. It was like her lower abdomen was missing. The Carabinieri, Italy's local police force, struggled to find a motive for the murder. But the isolated setting for the attack prompts investigators to make a connection with an unsolved murder from seven years earlier. In 1974, there was a very similar case in an area north of Florence. Two young people who had been making love in a car were killed. Pasquale Gentilcore and Stefania Patini 
have been found viciously murdered in the countryside just outside Florence. And there are other similarities. Again, the murder seems to have no motive, and the female victim was singled out for mutilation. Dopo la morte della ragazza, after the death of the girl, an additional number of stab wounds were inflicted on her, mostly around the genital area. A livello della vagina, a vine branch was also inserted into her vagina. un tralcio di vite. As the people of Florence reel from the shock that the two murders could be linked, the investigation takes a surprising turn. A local man known to spy on courting couples, Enzo Spalletti, is arrested and charged with the murders. The city breathes a sigh of relief. He was known as a peeping tom. It was believed he was discovered watching this couple and had reacted by killing them. It looked like it was nothing more than a tragic story. But as the Carabinieri hold Spalletti in jail, believing they have caught the killer, their investigation is thrown into turmoil. A young couple spend the evening together. After a movie, they escape to the countryside just outside Florence. But they are not alone. <laughs> The attack is alarmingly similar to the earlier murders. They're both shot, and the female victim is dragged from the car to be violated. They are identified as 26-year-old Stefano Baldi and his 24-year-old fiancée, Susanna Cambi. They were due to be married in a few months' time. You could not help but notice the beauty of the girl, of her face, and at the same time, the mutilation was terrible, worse than the earlier ones. It's painfully clear to investigators that they have arrested the wrong man. Spalletti is released without charge. It's a huge setback. But the Carabinieri find crucial evidence at the crime scene. Bullet casings, similar to ones found at the two previous attacks. Forensics run ballistic tests and make a crucial discovery. Francesco Donato is head of the forensic science lab for the Tuscan police. All the bullet cases on the crime scenes could be traced back to 22 caliber cartridges. Hence, all the crime scenes were connected to the same type of ammunition. The same type of weapon has been used in all three of the murders. It was at this time, after the third murder, that they realized the existence of a serial killer. And police realized that there can only be one killer, such as the singular brutality and the signature genital mutilation. He want to make it clear that the perpetrator was him and no one else. There was a maniac on the loose, and panic spread through Florence. The question on everyone's lips is not will the killer strike again, but when. Three couples murdered in the quiet foothills around Florence. Seven years have passed since the first attack in 1974. And the Italian Carabinieri are no further forward in trapping the serial killer responsible for the murders. Journalist Mario Spezzi, who has followed the case from the beginning, gives the killer a name. I used the term the monster of Florence to create a parallel with other historic crimes such as the monster of Dusseldorf and the monster of Boston. The monster's crimes are identified by a grotesque mark. The entire genital area of the female victim is cut out and removed. Even hard-boiled journalists are doubtful about revealing the truth. 
The people of Florence are gripped by fear. A killer is amongst them. Uh, there were uh, wives uh, denouncing the husbands or uh, former husbands, mothers denouncing the sons, uh, sons denouncing the father. The Carabinieri are frustrated by their lack of progress with the case, and the investigation is suffering due to contamination of vital evidence at the crime scenes. The murders had been committed in the countryside. Mostly they were discovered by people not belonging to the law enforcement. There were bunches of flowers from people in the village to remember the victims of the monster. Nobody was wearing shoe covers, nobody wore gloves, and nobody wore overalls. That time, there were not the precautions at the crime scene that today are considered standard. Forensic science is still in its infancy in the 1980s, but investigators are starting to build a picture of how the monster operates. He comes slowly to the vehicle and then, suddenly, using a torch, illuminates the inside of the car. The sudden and violent light has the same effect as a rabbit crossing the road and getting caught in car headlights. The monster takes advantage of this moment to shoot. One of the elements which characterized the, the, the crime scene was that he killed the man first and then he dragged the, the body of the female victims far from uh, their fiancés, sort of stressing his possession over the female victim. Abbiamo anche ipotizzato we hypothesized that, given the way he cut out the pubic area, that he was an expert knife user. A surgeon, a gynecologist, maybe. A person who used certain blades as part of his job. But we had no idea why he killed, or why he removed these pieces of the female victim. To progress, investigators need to get inside the mind of the monster. But time is against them, and the killer is free to strike again. On June the 19th, 1982, in a country road just outside Florence, Passing motorists report what they initially believed to be a traffic accident. Ambulance driver Lorenzo Allegranti is called to the scene. We arrived four or five minutes after the call. And when we arrived, we saw immediately it was something very different. In the car, our childhood sweethearts, Paolo Mainardi and Antonella Migliorini, the monster's latest victims. First of all, I saw Antonella. I realized there was nothing to be done for her. She was already dead. The other victim was lying on the back seat. Twenty-two-year-old Paolo Menardi has survived the attack. I wanted to be very fast to see if we could save the guy, in the hope that he would lead us to the monster. This time, the victim saw their attacker approaching. The guy started the car and tried to escape by putting the car into reverse. 
However, the car got stuck with the back wheels in the gutter. The murderer showed a cool reaction because he shot out the headlamps and then shot the guy. But his attack does not go to plan. He was close to the village and afraid of being caught, so he didn't mutilate the victim, but left the scene. In his panic to escape, the monster has failed to realize that Paolo is still alive. It's the first time the killer has made a mistake. Investigators are desperately hoping that the critically injured Mainadi will survive and help them solve the case. He died in the morning at around four, quarter past four. It was a big blow, because by saving him, things could have been different. Mainardi has died without being able to reveal anything about the murderer. But the Carabinieri see an opportunity to try and trick the killer and drive him out into the open. I remember clearly the day after we were called by the state prosecutor. She said, I would like to ask you for a favor. Could you publish a false story that possibly the victim had said something or seen something? Hopefully the murderer will read the story and perhaps make a mistake. It is just days after Mainardi's funeral. Lorenzo Allegranti, the ambulance driver who tended the dying Paolo, is asleep in bed. Pronto? Pronto? Mainardi, che cosa ha detto? Pronto, chi parla? Yeah, keep on that. He said, the monster of Florence. E mi dice che he told me to be very careful because he could carry out a massacre. A fare una strage. It seems the false story that the dying Paolo Menardi had described his attacker has succeeded in getting a reaction from the monster. Allegranti is given police protection. There were many more calls. I was always harassed by the monster via the telephone. Pronto? Stai molto attento a quello che dici, o sei un uomo morto. Che poi quando mi dice Once he told me to be careful about my family. But the calls cannot be traced. The investigators are running out of time, and they know the monster will strike again. Then, a lead emerges that completely changes the direction of the case. It comes in the form of an anonymous letter an anonymous letter was sent which said, why don't you look at the murder of 1968? Fourteen years earlier, just outside Florence, a couple were shot dead in their car in an isolated spot. The investigators search police archives and discover the case has a startling similarity to the monster killings. The couple were shot with a .22 caliber gun. Eight shell casings were found on the ground at the murder scene and are still in police files. Forensic experts examine the bullet shells. 
To be able to tell if the shells all came from the same weapon, they have to be analyzed using a comparative microscope. This is the imprint of the firing pin enlarged. Here we can see the particular characteristics that identify the cartridge. The microscopic imprints made on the bullet by the gun when fired are unique to each weapon. The results are staggering. All these shells were all fired from the same weapon. These murders, more than 20 years apart, have been committed using the same gun. The victims in 1968 were a married woman, Barbara Locci, and her lover, Antonio Lobianco. Investigators discover that their killer was Barbara's jealous husband and that he is still serving a life sentence in prison. The common link must be the murder weapon. The Carabinieri get to work tracing the source of the .22 caliber Beretta that was used to kill Barbara Locci. Someone around that woman, someone from her circle, had the gun. The trail leads them to a notorious thug called Francesco Vinci, who had also been a lover of the murdered Barbara. He was a macho man who liked to show off his uh, masculinity to women. Vinci had a reputation for being violent. As investigators become convinced they have a prime suspect in their sights, new evidence appears which could confirm their suspicions. Days after the murder of Paolo Menardi and Antonella Migliorini, an abandoned car was found hidden in the woods. The owner has finally been traced. The car belongs to Francesco Vinci. The race is on to construct a case against Vinci. But as the Carabinieri hold their prime suspect in custody, their investigation is once more thrown off track. Reporter Mario Spezzi finds himself at the scene of yet another double murder. That night I stopped my car there and I came here and I saw all the policemen and um, magistrates. They were here and they were really shocked because at that time they were sure a monster, the monster was in jail. Francesco Vinci was the monster. Investigators quickly run ballistics tests on bullet shells found at the scene. There is no doubt the monster is still at large, and he has killed again. Eight young men and women have been slaughtered in the Italian countryside. Police have been chasing leads, but they have come to nothing. The monster of Florence is still at large, and he has killed again. Two German tourists have been shot dead in their camper van. But for the second time, the monster's attack has gone wrong. The policemen say, have a look inside. I looked and I thought it was a girl. It was a, a boy with long, very blonde hair. He was very slim. Me too, when I saw it the first time, I thought it was a girl. The murdered men are two students, Wilhelm Meyer and Uwe Rusch Sens. Investigators think the killer has mistaken one of the long-haired students for a woman. They believe that on discovering both his victims are male, the monster has no interest in completing his ritual. The primary motivation for committing the murder was not the death of the victim, but the mutilation itself. The monster of Florence has claimed 10 victims in 10 years. His last two attacks failed to secure him his desired trophy. He will not make the same mistake again. Nineteen-year-old Pio Rontini and 21-year-old Claudio Stefanacci are engaged. 
Quella sera andarono, si appartarono, andarono in una località che si chiama They went to a place called La Boschetta and not seeing them returning home after midnight, their friends found them because they knew where they normally went. They too are found shot dead. But this time the mutilation is even more savage. Il rito è sempre il solito. The rite is always the same. He always cuts off the pubic area. However, in this case, the monster also mutilated the woman's breasts. Florence is a city in panic. Le coppie dei giovani italiani non si appartano più. Young Italian couples did not isolate themselves any longer, as they were afraid. In all the shops, in all the bars, there were posters encouraging young people not to go to remote areas, not to isolate themselves, because it was dangerous. But not everyone understands the danger. In September 1985, French tourists Nadine Moriot and Jean-Michel Crabishvili are in Tuscany on holiday. They camped in the woods around Scopetti. The monster immediately killed the girl. The guy was only hit in his hand and they managed to get out of the tent and tried to escape. However, he took the wrong turning. If he had run in the opposite direction, he would have got to the main road. But instead, he ran into the woods and was caught by the monster who cut his throat. It's soon revealed by the monster why he has targeted and killed the French tourists. He had killed two foreigners, so there was no report of missing people. Then he sent an anonymous letter to the state prosecutor. Inside this letter was a piece of the victim's breast that had been cut off. The contents of the letter appear to be part of a sick game the monster wants to play with investigators. He wanted the office of the prosecutor to receive this letter without knowing that the murder had been committed and they would now have to look for the victims. Fortunately, the killer's intentions fail. Luckily, a person hunting mushrooms found the bodies a few hours before the arrival of the letter. With the murder toll now at 14, the people of Florence are losing patience. They are angry, scared, and frustrated with an investigation that has failed to trap the killer. Public opinion was very agitated. The police and the courts were under immense pressure. It had become the black spot of Italy. An episode like this has never happened before in the criminal history of Italy. With the public demanding action, the case is transferred to the Polizia, Italy's national police force. Chief Inspector Ruggero Perugini heads up the investigation. There was a widespread sense of hopelessness. Most of the leads had been explored. Perugini, an admirer of the FBI, is determined to get results. We decided, let's approach the investigation with a new start. Okay, just stick into the facts. Perugini initiates a massive screening program of local criminals, utilizing the new police computers and databases in the Polizia's head office. 
we decide to start with Tuscany and to analyze those with criminal records who were free to act in those dates. Investigators cross-reference the times and locations of the murders with the movements of the convicted offenders they have identified. One name is coming up again and again. He is a convicted rapist and murderer, and he lives in the crucible of the monster's killing zone. His name is Pietro Pacciani. He is married with three children and is a farm laborer. His record makes disturbing reading. In the 1950s, when Pacciani was engaged to a girl who was the beauty of the village, he discovered her in a car with a traveling salesman. He intervened and killed the man. Pacciani served 13 years for the murder of the traveling salesman. There is a detail from his trial in 1951 that interests Perugini. Pacciani said that seeing his girlfriend naked with another man is what had driven him to kill. The sight of the left breast of this girl, together with this man, had unchained his reaction. Could it be that Pacciani is acting out his revenge on women for this betrayal? Perugini questions his prime suspect. He may be a peasant farmer, but the vastly experienced detective soon realizes that Pacciani is a cunning man. So I was uh, very much impressed by his brightness and by his ability to manipulate me. I came out from that first contact with the impression that Pacciani could pretty much fit with the profile that we had. The Polizia closely study their prime suspect. Pacciani may be over 60 and have health problems, but investigators believe he is capable of committing murder. Monitoring his behavior, we noticed that uh, this problem didn't prevent him uh, doing things that were not normally compatible with uh, uh, this kind of illness, such as uh, carrying a big trunk of a tree uphill. And we discovered he was a man of uh, great strength, not tall, but extremely strong. Perugini is convinced he's closing in on the monster, but he needs evidence to build a case against Pacciani. The Polizia embark on a series of rigorous searches at Pacciani's house. It is the longest search ever conducted, 11 days and nights, during which we of the squad hardly slept. The Polizia's perseverance pays off. They find an artist's notebook that could link Pacciani to one of the murders. We were astonished to find this drawing pad in Pacciani's house, since you couldn't buy them in Italy. We managed to trace where the drawing pads were sold. It was a shop in Osnabrück, the same shop where the two young Germans went to buy their drawing books. It's damning evidence, but to build a homicide case, officers need to link Pacciani to the murder weapon. They believe the .22 calibre gun used in all the killings must have been lost or stolen after the murder of Barbara Locci in 1968 and has somehow fallen into the possession of Pacciani. A seemingly impossible task until there is an astonishing breakthrough. I saw the, the, the reflection of the light of something metallic. They find a bullet in Pacciani's garden. We had it taken out of the ground and we had it immediately delivered to the forensic police in order to have it analyzed. The Polizia have bullets and shells from all of the murder scenes. 
It is Francesco Donato's task to compare them with the bullet they have found in Pacciani's garden. If they match, the polizia have found the monster. Abbiamo stabilito la perfetta coincidenza e quindi they were a perfect match. The cartridge found in Pacciani's garden was definitely from the same weapon that was used in the double homicides of the monster of Florence. Investigators now have enough evidence to make a case against Pacciani. His trial begins in April 1994. Pacciani pleads his innocence. On the 1st of November 1994, the verdict is announced. Dove il popolo italiano, la Corte d'Assise di primo grado di Firenze, sezione prima dichiara Pacciani Pietro colpevole dei diritti a lui ascritti e lo condanna alla pena dell'ergastolo con isolamento diurno per la durata di anni 3. Amidst chaotic scenes, Pietro Pacciani leaves the courtroom to begin his life sentence in Soliciano prison. But is Florence now free of the monster? The monster of Florence, Pietro Pacciani, is finally behind bars for seven brutal double murders. But the polizia have little time to enjoy securing Pacciani's conviction before questions begin to be asked about whether they have the right man. Sister Anna Marie Mazzari is a prison visitor who befriends Pacciani. I believed in the innocence of Pacciani. I don't believe he was capable of such actions. He spoke to me about the bullet they found in his garden. He told me, someone has put it here. He considered these things an attempt to frame him, to try to make him look guilty. Controversy is growing over evidence from the final murder scene, committed in 1985, that casts serious doubt over Pacciani's conviction. Questo avvenendo in una zona non molto frequentata, because the attack happened in a remote area, the bodies were not found immediately. As more time passes between the event that causes death and the finding of the body, the more difficult it becomes to identify the time of death. Più difficile è identificare il momento della morte. The polizia assert that French tourists Nadine Moriot and Jean-Michel Cravishvili were killed on the Sunday night. But the contents of their stomachs still contained traces of rabbit pasta eaten on the Saturday, prompting some to claim they died on the Saturday night. The problem of establishing if the murder was committed on Saturday or Sunday is fundamental to the investigation because if the murder was Saturday, Pacciani had a strong alibi because he was at the village feast where a great number of people saw him. I colleghi che hanno eseguito l'autopsia hanno posto la morte la domenica. The people who performed the autopsy concluded the time of death was Sunday night, not Saturday. Clearly, I can understand their difficulty in establishing the time of death as the bodies were in an advanced state of putrefaction. But in this specific case, I don't agree with my colleagues. I thought and still think they did not die on Sunday, but Saturday evening. Unanswered questions about the murder of Kravishvili also remain. Pacciani era un uomo di più di 60 anni. Pacciani was a man of more than 60 years old. He had a weak heart as he had undergone two or three bypasses, was very chubby and suffered from emphysema. It strongly contrasts with the escape of the young guy who practiced athletics frequently. With so many elements of the case being called into question, Pacciani successfully appeals his conviction. 
but investigators remain convinced of Pacciani's guilt. One can question everything and not believe anything. The point of fact is that from the day of Pacciani's sentence, the monster did not eat again. The Polizia are determined not to accept defeat. They return to conduct another search of the evidence seized from Pacciani's house. We found a picture of a woman whose left breast had been uh, outlined by trait of pen this time, and whose vagina had been outlined. Investigators get to work securing new evidence to prove Pacciani's guilt beyond doubt. But then, the investigation takes a totally unexpected twist. The Polizia find evidence that Pacciani was not acting alone. Two of his friends, Mario Vanni, a retired postman, and vagrant Giancarlo Lotti, confess to helping Pacciani commit the murders. They confessed to having taken part. And their statements were credible because they were consistent with the crime scene. Both men are found guilty of four of the double murders. Vanni gets life, and Lotti, who has cooperated with the police, a reduced sentence of 26 years. The Polizia believe that Pacciani convinced his two friends to join him in the murders. Pacciani was a very strong personality. I wouldn't exclude that the, as he manipulated uh, most of those who were surrounding him, he could have manipulated also other people. Investigators are determined to get Pacciani back behind bars, and the conviction of Lotti and Vanni mean they can retry him. This time, they are certain they will prove conclusively that Pacciani was the leader of a group of cold-blooded murderers. But days before Pacciani's retrial, he is found dead in his home. Mirekai I went into the house and found Pacciani on the ground. His body was taken to the forensic lab and I did the autopsy, which gave clear results. Pacciani suffered from severe heart problems. It was an exhausted heart. For some, the death of Pietro Pacciani leaves the case unresolved and questions unanswered. I don't think we will ever know who the monster of Florence was. Once the investigation led us to Pacciani, there weren't any more victims. Hence the monster didn't hit again. Hence the investigation made sense. I am absolutely convinced that Pacciani was guilty. 100% convinced. One of the biggest questions remaining is why the murders were committed. In 2007, a new suspect, Francesco Calamandre, a chemist, was accused of being part of a satanic circle that commissioned the monster killings to obtain body parts for ritualistic sacrifices. But Calamandre was acquitted. Only one thing is certain. The monster of Florence still casts a shadow over Tuscany. The horrors linger in the minds of the investigators who worked on this distressing case. The violence done to those poor women. Violence I had nightmares about. I woke up many times a night with the image of mutilated bodies in front of my eyes. They are not things that you could easily forget. A series of horrific unsolved crimes that brought 20 years of terror to Italy. There was great terror, great fear. Over two decades, seven helpless couples are stalked by a deranged and perverted killer. There was a maniac on the loose in Florence who murdered them and mutilated the genitalia of the young women.
I woke up many times at night with the image of mutilated bodies in front of my eyes. Investigators struggle to snare a killer who evades the police at will. There was a widespread sense of hopelessness. This is the story of murders so savage they could only be committed by a monster. Florence, one of the most romantic cities in the world. But in the 1980s, Italy is a deeply religious country, where premarital sex is frowned upon. <laughs> a young couple escape to the countryside, far from the watchful eye of 21-year-old Carmela Di Nuccio and her 30-year-old boyfriend Giovanni Foggi had spent the evening at the local disco before driving up into the hills for a lover's tryst. Not only have the couple been brutally executed, the killer has violated the female victim in a sinister and sickening way. We were perplexed by the fury of the attack, especially the violence inflicted on the girl. She had her pubic area cut out. She had, very shockingly, a wound below her abdomen that could not really be described as a wound. It was like her lower abdomen was missing. The Carabinieri, Italy's local police force, struggled to find a motive for the murder. But the isolated setting for the attack prompts investigators to make a connection with an unsolved murder from seven years earlier. In 1974, there was a very similar case in an area north of Florence. Two young people who had been making love in a car were killed. Pasquale Gentilcore and Stefania Pettini have been found viciously murdered in the countryside just outside Florence. And there are other similarities. Again, the murder seems to have no motive, and the female victim was singled out for mutilation. After the death of the girl, an additional number of stab wounds were inflicted on her, mostly around the genital area. A vine branch was also inserted into her vagina. As the people of Florence reel from the shock that the two murders could be linked, the investigation takes a surprising turn. A local man known to spy on courting couples, Enzo Spalletti, is arrested and charged with the murders. The city breathes a sigh of relief. He was known as a peeping tom. It was believed he was discovered watching this couple and had reacted by killing them. It looked like it was nothing more than a tragic story. But as the Carabinieri hold Spalletti in jail, believing they have caught the killer, their investigation is thrown into turmoil. A young couple, parents, The isolation this couple seek will turn out to be anything but romantic. On the morning of June the 6th, 1981, an off-duty policeman makes a gruesome discovery. The bodies of two young lovers. Forensic pathologist Giovanni Morello examines the victims. The couple had numerous injuries on their bodies. 
a number of gunshot wounds and a number of knife wounds. Journalist Mario Spezzi is one of the first people on the crime scene. I saw the guy in the car. He seemed like he was sleeping because he had his head resting on the side window. And the only things that showed that something had happened was the pale face, the broken glass and a small black mark on his head. Former Chief Inspector Ruggero Perugini knows that even the smallest clue could lead them to their killer. Every element of the crime scene is essential. What is missing, what is there, the context, the details are essential. Investigators piece together the victim's final evening. Spend the evening together. After a movie, they escape to the countryside just outside Florence. But they are not alone. <laughs> The attack is alarmingly similar to the earlier murders. They're both shot, and the female victim is dragged from the car to be violated. They are identified as 26-year-old Stefano Baldi and his 24-year-old fiancée, Susanna Cambi. They were due to be married in a few months' time. You could not help but notice the beauty of the girl, of her face, and at the same time, the mutilation was terrible, worse than the earlier ones. It's painfully clear to investigators that they have arrested the wrong man. Spalletti is released without charge. It's a huge setback. But the Carabinieri find crucial evidence at the crime scene. Bullet casings, similar to ones found at the two previous attacks. Forensics run ballistic tests and make a crucial discovery. Francesco Donato is head of the forensic science lab for the Tuscan police. 